Father God, we thank you for this day, a unique day of rest and celebration and feasting and renewal. Uh, We come to you uh, this morning with souls that hunger for you and for your truth. Uh, Once again, the world has left us thirsty, and we desire the living water that only you can provide. And so, Father, would you be with us now? Would you speak to us? Would you do your good work in us by your word and by the power of your Holy Spirit? I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, will you please stand for the reading of God's word? I'll be reading Exodus 16. They set out from Elam, and all the congregation of the people of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after they had departed from the land of Egypt. And the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness, and the people of Israel said to them, Would that we have died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into the wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger." Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am about to rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day, that I may test them, whether they will walk in my law or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. So Moses and Aaron said to all the people of Israel, At evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your grumbling against the Lord. For what are we that you grumble against us? And Moses said, When the Lord gives you in the evening meat to eat, and in the morning bread to the full, because the Lord has heard your grumbling that you grumble against him, what are we? Your grumbling is not against us, but against the Lord." Then Moses said to Aaron, say to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, come near before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. And as soon as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. And the Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the people of Israel. Say to them, at twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God." In the evening, quail came up and covered the camp, and in the morning, dew lay around the camp. And when the dew had gone up, there was on the face of the wilderness a fine flake-like thing, fine as frost on the ground. When the people of Israel saw it, they said to one another, what is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, it is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Gather of it, each one of you, as much as he can eat. You shall each take an omer according to the number of the persons that each of you has in his tent. And the people of Israel did so. They gathered some more, some less. But when they measured it with an omer, whoever gathered much had nothing left over, and whoever gathered little had no lack. Each of them gathered as much as he could eat. And Moses said to them, Let no one leave any of it over till the morning. But they did not listen to Moses. Some left part of it till the morning. And it bred worms and stank. And Moses was angry with them. Morning by morning they gathered it, each as much as he could eat. But when the sun grew hot, it melted. On the sixth day they gathered twice as much bread, two omers each. And when all the leaders of the congregation came and told Moses, he said to them, This is what the Lord has commanded. Tomorrow is a day of solemn rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you will bake and boil what you will boil. And all that is left over lay aside to be kept till morning." So they laid it aside till the morning as Moses commanded them, and it did not stink, and there were no worms in it. Moses said, Eat it today, for today is a Sabbath to the Lord. Today you will not find it in the field. Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, which is a Sabbath, there will be none. On the seventh day some of the people went out to gather, but they found none. And the Lord said to Moses, How long will you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? See, The Lord has given you the Sabbath. Therefore, on the sixth day, he gives you bread for two days. Remain each of you in his place. Let no one go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. Now the house of Israel called its name manna. It was like coriander seed, white, and the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. Moses said, this is what the Lord has commanded. Let an omer of it be kept throughout your generation so that they may see the bread with which I fed you in the wilderness when I brought you out of the land of Egypt. 
And Moses said to Aaron, take a jar and put an omer of manna in it and place it before the Lord to be kept throughout your generations. As the Lord commanded Moses, so Aaron placed it before the testimony to be kept. The people of Israel ate the manna 40 years till they came to a habitable land. They ate the manna till they came to the border of the land of Canaan. And omer is the 10th part of an epath. This is God's word. You may be seated. One, uh, one of the most um, important and, and yet overlooked lessons from the book of Exodus is that we have two slave masters, and God is working to save us from both of them. The first slave master is the focus of the first 12 chapters of the book, and that slave master is, of course, Pharaoh. And Pharaoh is an example of all external forms of slavery that are imposed upon us from the outside. This slavery can come from Satan, it can come from the world, or it can come from, as in Pharaoh's case, corrupt leaders and governments. And this is represented in Revelation chapter 13 by the beast from the sea and then the beast from the land. There are two slave masters. So the first slave master is external, is Pharaoh. The second slave master is internal. And in John chapter 8, Jesus confronts the Pharisees about this kind of slavery. In verses 33 through 34, it says, They answered him, We are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? And Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits a sin is a slave to sin. There is a slave master that is more crafty, more elusive, more brutal more dehumanizing, more violent, more narcissistic, and more stubborn than even Pharaoh. This slave master is internal, and it's part of us, and it's harder to see. And therefore, this slave master is actually more deadly and more dangerous than Pharaoh. And that slave master, according to Jesus, is sin. Now, I want you to think about the book of Exodus, Right? There are 12 chapters devoted to God freeing his people from Pharaoh. But Exodus does not end in chapter 12. And it does not end in chapter 13. It does not end at the crossing of the Red Sea. It keeps going on. Because the rest of Exodus is mostly about God setting his people free from this inner slave master. That is sin. In fact, most of the Bible is about how God is setting us free from that slave master. And though Moses was, in fact, able to free God's people from slavery to Pharaoh, it is going to take somebody far greater than Moses to free us from our sin. So with that in mind, I want us to dive into this text, and we're going to press into three different things together. They are the supernatural power of God, the test of manna, and the gift of Sabbath. The supernatural power of God, the test of manna, and the gift of Sabbath. And we'll begin by looking at the supernatural power of God. And this may seem like a, why do we have to talk about this? But I think you'll see it's actually very important that we talk about this. Um, If you do any book work and study and you read commentaries and theologians, you will notice that there is a, a temptation and a tendency, especially amongst what I refer to as inerrancy challenged liberal theologians, Uh, there is a tendency to naturalize what the Bible explicitly presents to us as supernatural, okay? There's a tendency to naturalize what the Bible explicitly presents to us as supernatural. And Exodus, throughout Exodus, there are all types of examples of this, but specifically chapter 16 is one of the places where this really shows up. And so those liberal theologians and commentators will suggest that the bread that we just read about, the manna in chapter 16, 
is nothing more than a known natural phenomenon that occurs in this region of the world. And there are, in fact, certain insects that secrete a sweet, sugary substance that can collect on bushes and at times can have a white, wafery appearance. And so they will read Genesis, or Exodus 16 and say, that's what's happening. What's happening is these insects are secreting the substance and the people are eating it and then they're giving God credit for this as if God did it, but it's really just these insects. But we know from the text, if, if we take the text seriously, we know that that is precisely not what is happening in this text. In verse 4, the whole event is introduced to us this way. It says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am about to rain bread from heaven for you. God is about to do something, and he's doing this for them. He is going to rain bread from heaven for them. So this is a unique act of God. Okay, Now, as you continue to go through the chapter and pay attention to the details about this bread, it makes it abundantly clear that any natural explanation for what is happening in the text is absolutely impossible. Okay, So we're going to walk through those together. First of all, while it is in fact true that certain insects in this region do in fact secrete a sugary substance, it would be absolutely unheard of for them to secrete the amount of substance that would be required to feed over a million people each day, okay? This is a lot of insect secretion. You're looking up to at least, if not over, a million gallons of insect secretion each day, okay? So that's the first point. Second, we read in the text that with the exception of the Sabbath, when this manna is saved overnight, it goes bad and it rots and it becomes filled with worms. If it is exposed to the daylight, it melts away. However, when it is saved on the evening going into the Sabbath, it is fine. And when it, is, when it is collected as a testimony to God's people, which is going to last for generations, that also does not rot. And that also is not infested with worms. And, right, so, so this is, something weird is happening here. Uh, third, we read that the manna appears in the morning six days a week. Not seven days a week, six days a week. Somehow, it never, ever ever appears on the Sabbath. And again, this happens for 40 years. Fourthly, the manna continues to follow Israel around the desert. But once they come to the land of promise, it suddenly and surprisingly disappears. So what we are reading here is, is not some natural phenomenon, but rather it is God working supernaturally to provide for and to sustain and to save his people. That's a very important point for us to note because what it means is that salvation and deliverance require nothing less than God's supernatural power. Right? To be rescued from the slave master requires God's supernatural power. Furthermore, it is God's supernatural provision of manna that gives his people confidence to obey him in the face of incredible odds. Because once Israel's done in the desert, right, it's not going to be easy living from that point forward. There are going to be challenges that they face. And what this is intended to do is that every time they face a challenge, they can do an inventory of how the odds are stacked against them and then look back at the manna and go, ha, doesn't matter. God's super supernatural provision is what delivers them. And so it's meant to give them confidence to obey him in the face of incredible odds. And that's actually what the entire point of the manna is about, which we will see in our next point, which is the test of manna. 
In verse 4, it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am about to rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day, that I, I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. God says the manna is a test. This is a test. Not only would this bread from heaven nourish their bodies, which of course it did, but this bread from heaven is also supposed to purify their souls. And it will purify their souls by exposing their fear and unbelief. And that is the test. Each day, according to the text, God would provide enough bread for each person for that day. And this is amount, the amount that they are instructed to gather each day in the morning. They are not told, with the exception of the day before the Sabbath, they are not told to take enough for two days. They are not told to take enough for three days or for four days. And sorry, Dave Ramsey, they're not told to take enough for three months. They are told to take enough for one day. Now, of course, the temptation would be that in fear and unbelief, that they would gather more than what they needed for one day, right? Because you get up and you, and, you, and you see this bread that appears and you're thinking, is it gonna be there tomorrow? How do I know when I wake up tomorrow, there will be bread? And so wouldn't it be wise for me to take enough for two days just in case tomorrow the bread doesn't show up? Right? That's the temptation, fear and unbelief. But what happens when they save some for the next day in the text? What happens? Every single time it stinks and it rots with worms. Now, there is a double lesson to be learned in this test. First of all, God will always provide for our daily needs always. God will always provide for our daily needs. The problem is that we often want God to provide for our tomorrow needs, or the next month needs, or the next year needs. But notice that when Jesus teaches his disciples to pray, and he's undoubtedly thinking about Exodus 16, when he teaches them to pray, he says, you know, pray for what kind of bread? Daily bread. Seek God and trust God and ask God for daily bread, not weekly bread, again, not monthly bread, but daily bread. So, so the test is God wants us to trust him to provide for our daily needs. He knows what they are. He will be faithful to provide them. Second, the second lesson, when in fear... Or in unbelief, we hold on to more than God instructs, we lose it. When in fear or unbelief, we hold on to more than God instructs, we lose it. God says, take enough for one day. But if they take more or they try to save it, right, it's gone. In verse 20, it says, but they did not listen to Moses, Surprise, they did not listen to Moses. Some left part of it till the morning and it bred worms and stank. So if they take enough bread for one day, everyone gets their fill. If they try for two days, it rots. Now, we have said, we've been broken records on this, that the book of Exodus is not just about what happened. The book of Exodus is about what? It's about what happens. This, this is not just true of this episode. This is not just true when it comes to this heavenly bread. What we see happening with the manna applies to everything. This applies to every sphere of life. Consider Malachi. And I want you to think about the similarities to what, uh, uh, to what God is saying through Malachi and what he said to Israel about the manna. Okay, chapter 3, verses 8 through 11. Will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. 
But you say, how have we robbed you? In your tithes and contributions. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. I will rebuke the devourer for you, so that it will not destroy the fruit of your soil, and your vine in the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. These are essentially the same things. The issue here is that Israel was keeping their tithe from God. A tithe is simply a 10% of the profit. And rather than trusting God and giving him the 10% that was rightfully his and then retaining and living off the 90%, they were keeping more from them for themselves and they were giving less to God. And then what happens? It's the same thing that happened in Exodus 16. The devourer happened. They kept for themselves and their fields rotted. The crops didn't produce. It's the same thing. The destroyer, the devourer got into their soil and it rotted just like the bread in Exodus 16. When in fear that they tried to hold on to more than God instructed, they lost it. And by trying to keep more, they ended up with less. God used the manna in the wilderness to test his people, and he used it to reveal to them that there is an inward slave master that does not want to relinquish control to God, who does not want to trust God for daily provision, and God is bound and determined to rescue them from that slave master as well. And Of course, the same is true for us. For us, the issue is not the bread that magically appears in our yards every morning. The issue is money. And money is the thing, the primary thing that God uses to test and reveal our hearts. This is why Jesus spoke about money so much. The test is not how much do you have, Or how little do you have? The test is this. Do you trust God with what he has provided for you? And the tithe is that test in many ways. By prioritizing and setting aside the tithe before any other item in our budget, we are saying, we trust you, God. This is what you have provided for us. And we will trust you and honor you and act in faith of your daily provision by setting 10% of that aside for you as worship. We do that, and we we are also acknowledging that God, in fact, does know the challenges of our current economy. He knows how the price of raising a family has skyrocketed, particularly under our current administration. God knows that the price of real estate in our community increasingly feels way out of grasp for many people. God knows the unjust and evil levels at which our government taxes us. God knows all of this, and he provides When we faithfully give God his tithe, we are saying, God, we trust you. And we will give you what is rightfully yours. We will give you what is rightfully yours. And you know that is not easy to do. The reality is that most Christians struggle with this. But it is one of the primary ways that God frees us from our belief in our slavery to sin. It is one of the primary ways that God tests and reveals our hearts because it is easy to say, I trust God. But it is hard to be faithful in generosity and giving. But I want you to acknowledge, I want you to just pay attention to something that God says in Malachi. God straight up says, test me. I dare you, test me. Do you want to see how this works? When we obey God in our tithes, 
we often discover that 90% of our income is more than 100% of our income. And if you have grown in obedience in this discipline, you will say, yes, this is true. 90% of our income is more than 100% of our income. How is that possible? Well, in Malachi, when the tithes were being withheld, right, the crops were devoured. The car was breaking down. The roof was leaking. All these things were consuming what they were trying to keep for themselves. But God says, when you are obedient to me and you, you give to me in faith and you trust me, right, I, I will provide and I will protect. A question that you may want to consider as you think about this is this. What do my finances reveal about my faith and my heart and my priorities? Our money is one of the truest examples of what we actually believe. So what do your financial habits reveal about what you value and your priorities? That is the test. That's what's happening with manna. Again, for us, it's different. Now, this leads us lastly to the gift of Sabbath. It says in verses 26 through 30, six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, which is a Sabbath, there will be none. On the seventh day, some of the people went out to gather, but they found none. And the Lord said to Moses, how long will you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? See, the Lord has given you the Sabbath. Therefore, on the sixth day, he gives you bread for two days. Remain each of you in his place. Let no one go out of this place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. Okay, so this is before the giving of the law. And by the way, when we get to the Ten Commandments later uh, after Easter, we're going to spend one week on each one of those commandments. So we'll have an entire week to the uh, commandment about Sabbath. But I want to just say this now, that we often think of the Sabbath, and the Pharisees thought of it this way, we see it as a rule and a law that we have to keep. But when we think about it that way, it misses the entire point. Because remember, God is giving the Sabbath to a people who have only known, ever in their life, they have only known slavery in Egypt. And do you know what slaves never get in Egypt? You know what they never get? A day off. They never get a day off. The idea of a day off was like, what is that? Like for 400 years, that didn't happen. So when God is rescuing his people from Pharaoh, external slave master, and sin, the internal slave master, when he's establishing this people, he says, this is a very important rule to me. You all need to take a break. If you see that as a, as a burdensome law, you are missing the point. Take a nap. That's what God says. In giving his people the gift of rest and Sabbath, God is making at least two important statements that we have to pay attention to. First, work is good. Work is good. Do not believe the lie that work is evil. There is a toilsome element to our work because of sin and the curse, but work is not part of the curse of sin. Work is good, and it is holy, and it is righteous. God worked for six days to create the world, and we are made in his image. And God has extended to us the task of exercising dominion over the world that he has both created and ordered according to his wisdom. And what that means is that God has entrusted to us the work of taking care of our little piece of Eden, which includes your apartments or your house. It includes your yard. It includes your vehicles. It includes your pets, and it includes providing for your family. Work is good, and work is holy. We need to be reminded of that. Anybody who says that work is bad, right, that's evil. To call work bad is evil. Work is good, but work 
is also not everything. We are created to work, and we are also created to rest. Because again, in creation, God gives us the pattern to follow. There are six days of work and one day of rest. Now, most of you have a five-day-a-week work schedule. Some of you work four tens or whatever. And don't freak out that because you work four days or five days that you're somehow violating the commandment. Because I'm pretty sure... There's other stuff around the house and taking care of your household, those things you're doing on those other days, right? So don't, this is not just about your paycheck. This is about your work. This is about dominion. So six days you work and one day you rest. And this is a gift. This is a gift that God gives us. And there are two different ways in which we ignore God's good gift of rest, The first way we ignore the gift of rest is by refusing to work hard for six days. This is the sin of slothfulness or laziness. The second way we ignore God's gift of rest is by refusing to rest on the Sabbath. And that, friends, is the sin of self-righteousness. Why? Is it self-righteous? It's self-righteous because when you say your standard of work is higher than God's standard of work, you're saying you have a holiness and a righteousness that exceeds the holiness and the righteousness of God. No, 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 no. Righteousness and holiness looks like six days of work, one day of rest. And so if you want to work seven days, that is self-righteousness. And you're saying you are holier than God. Now, what is it that happens when we ignore God's gift of rest? It's interesting in verse 27, it says this, On the seventh day, some of the people went out to gather, but they found none. They went out to gather, but they found none. It's not that God had failed to provide what they were looking for. Rather, they were looking in the wrong place and at the wrong time. And whenever we neglect God's command to rest, it is almost always because we are searching and striving for something other than what God provides. And whatever it is that we are looking for, whatever it is we are searching for, just like Israel, we don't find it. We don't find it. We go out to gather, we go and search, but we find nothing. And what that means is that both the manna in Exodus 16 and the Sabbath share some very important things in common. First of all, they are both gifts that invite us to enjoy what God graciously provides. Both manna and the Sabbath are gifts that invite us to enjoy what God graciously provides. Second, both of them are tests that expose our lack of trust in God's daily provision. When we refuse to rest, we are refusing to trust. Third, both the manna and the Sabbath are signs that point beyond themselves to Christ. In John chapter 6, there is a story when Jesus is faced with a large crowd and there is uh, a couple loaves of bread and some fish before him and he feeds this massive crowd and they start following him around and it leads to this conversation. And in that conversation, Jesus says this, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven But my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Jesus is most certainly thinking about Exodus 16 and the manna that God provided. 
And it's as if he reminds them. You remember, remember how, how Moses was leading the people and, and, and God rained down bread from heaven to feed them? You remember that story? And of course, they'd be like, yeah, yeah, we remember that story. And then what Jesus says is not what we would expect him to say. He doesn't say, I have come down to give you bread from heaven. But rather he says, I am bread from heaven. I am the bread of life. And if you would receive, if you would receive me, then you would never know hunger again. That's an amazing claim. I am the bread from heaven, and if you receive me, you will never know hunger again. There is something deep within every single person. And it is an inescapable desire and a drive and a hunger for satisfaction and fulfillment. And as you pursue that fulfillment, as you pursue that satisfaction, you start to observe something. You start to learn something. You start to realize that there is not enough vacation time or leisure, or pleasure, or hobbies, or hard work, or accomplishment, or acknowledgement, or sex, or money. There's not enough of that in in the world to satisfy what you are longing for. And you can chase after it as hard as you want and as long as you want, but you will never find it. You'll be like the Israelites. You go out, but there's none to be found. You will never find that contentment and that satisfaction until you find it in Christ. He is the bread from heaven given by the Father. He is the bread of life which satisfies our souls. And when we cease our striving and we come to him by faith and repentance, then and only then do we find the life and the rest that our souls so desperately long for. Friends, I want you to think about this. It is impossible to overstate the extravagance of Jesus' promise. You can't overstate it. He says, come to me, you will never have hunger again. Never. You will only know the truth of that statement by coming to him and trusting him and obeying him. And you will taste and you will see that he truly satisfies. So church, come to him today.